Namaste and greetings. I, Ritika Sundar, a researcher at IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, Prabhav Ivamniti Anusandhan Sanstan, Nayadali, warmly welcome you all to IMPRI hashtag web policy talk. Today, we have gathered here for a panel discussion on National Family Health Survey, Round 5, 2019 to 2021, under a gender lens. This talk is a part of the series, The State of Gender Equality, Hashtag Gender Gaps, which is organized by Gender Impact Study Center. The chair of today's session is Professor Vibhuti Patel, visiting professor, IMPRI, and former professor, Tata Institute of Social Sciences, Mumbai. Ma'am, I request your permission to introduce the speakers. Please, Ritika, go ahead and introduce the speakers. Thank you, ma'am. Poonam Mutreja, Executive Director of the Population Foundation of India, has over 40 years experience of being a strong advocate for women's health, reproductive and sexual rights and rural livelihoods. Welcome up. Dr. Sai Dunisa is a professor and head in the Department of Biostatistics and Epidemiology at the International Institute for Population Sciences in Mumbai. She has been working on infertility, gender and nutrition issues, and she has carried out cross-sectional impact evaluation and longitudinal studies in most states with funding of UNICEF, WHO, World Bank, Ford Foundation, and the Government of India. Ravi Dugal is a sociologist trained at the University of Bombay and also holds a postgraduate diploma in business management. He is presently an independent researcher and consultant. He has been involved in many health services, research, advocacy, and training, especially related to health economics, primary healthcare systems, health policy, budgets, decentralization, human rights, right to healthcare, and reproductive health for nearly four decades. Finally, Dr. Mala Ramanathan is a professor at the Achitha Menon Center for Health Science Studies, Thiruvananthapuram. She is a trained statistician, demographer with a PhD from the International Institute for Population Sciences in Mumbai. Welcome, ma'am. We look forward to learning from our eminent panelists and we look forward to an enriching deliberation. With that, I hand it over to Professor Vibhuti Patel. Welcome, ma'am. Yeah, good evening, friends. First of all, I would like to offer my heartfelt thanks uh, to Dr. Arjun Kumar, Ritika, and Impri team for providing this platform for discussion on such a vital issue as NFHS5. Whole of India is now academicians and activists and health uh, researchers are debating the findings of NFHS5. Uh, and my co-panelists, Professor Say, Say Dunisa, Ms. Punamutreja, Professor Mala Ramnathan, and Ravi Dukkal, all of them are experienced and highly erudite and very prolific writers as well as public intellectuals. And we are going to learn a lot from them. We know that uh, the NFHS 5 release recently has come out with several uh, shocking findings rather, which have been hotly debated throughout the country. Uh, this has motivated IMPRI to organize this panel discussion. And we know that NFHS uh, data are highly, uh, they have a high credit value and it, they are large scale multi-round survey conducted in a representative sample of households throughout the country. NFHS 1, which was, which, which came out with its findings in 93, it was, the survey was conducted in 92, 93, and it was the first NFHS survey collected extensive information on population, health, nutrition, with an emphasis on women and young children. 18 population research centers located in the universities and institutes of national repute assisted International Institute of Population Sciences in, the, uh, in, uh, in all stages of conducting NFHS1. And all the state level and national level reports for the survey have been uh, published and the most important thing is that they are in a public domain, easily accessible, easily downloadable. Uh, NFHS two 
on, conducted in 1998-99. It expanded its scope, scope and it also added features on quality of health, family planning services, domestic violence, reproductive health, cesarean section, uh, incidences of cesarean section, anemia, nutrition of women, and status of women. And the result of survey are currently, they, they have been published widely. They have been used extensively by the women's rights organizations uh, and the reproductive health researchers. And if it is three conducted in 2005 and six, uh, 2005 to six, uh, had 18 research organizations, including five population research centers, which were involved in carrying out the survey in 29 states of our country. And FHS4 covered a range of health related issues, including fertility, infant and child mortality, maternal and child health, perinatal mortality, adolescent reproductive health, high risk sexual behavior, uh, safe inject, uh, the, the safe injections, tuberculosis, malaria, non-communicable disease, domestic violence, HIV AIDS knowledge, and attitudes and the knowledge, attitude, and practice studies they were, they were conducted. NFHS 5 was carried out in two phases. Uh, first phase from 17 June to 30th January 2020, and phase two, and you know, it was in the midst of pandemic that these surveys were conducted. And phase two was from 2nd January 2020 to 30th April uh, by 17 field agencies which gathered information of uh, more than 6 lakh 36 thousand uh, 699 households which is a huge sample uh, more than 7 lakh women were involved and uh, 10 uh, yeah 10 lakh uh, men were involved and fact sheets of each state and ut and this uh, union territory and the district of india is available separately while NFHS5 reveals that there are more women than men in India now, women have done well in some parameters such as ownership of bank accounts, mobile phone, voice in the family decision making, fertility rates. Uh, the worrying trend that we see is that women have fared poorly in health indicators and more women are underweight or overweight than male counterparts. Nutrition level is abysmally low so far as women are concerned. Anemia has increased among women and children. And these trends, uh, they, are, they are revealed by uh, NFHS 5, and they are being debated, especially the question of a, a favorable sex ratio for adult women. Uh, this is a highly uh, debated. There are several articles written in newspapers and academic journals. And uh, it is in this context that the four experts who are here, they are going to share their knowledge and experience in this domain and insights and that, that will be immensely uh, enrich our understanding. So first of all, I would like to ask the, um, Dr. Saeed Unisa from IIPS. She has been associated with NFHS for a long time. And that how do you interpret these findings that women have outnumbered men? And many have expressed doubt over these findings. Uh, and there are states which have uh, also had poor record. Uh, uh, there are Gujarat, Maharashtra, Arunachal Pradesh, and there are states, but I think overall sex ratio is shown as a fav uh, favorable. And the second very important uh, uh, aspect is that of what are the driving, what are the factors which are driving this trend? And can you also tell us about the overall findings of uh, NFHS5, major highlights of NFHS5? Over to Professor Saeed Thank you, Professor Vibhuti Patel and uh, all my other panel members. Uh, uh, let me share my this thing. The screen. We can see it, ma'am. Yeah. Yeah. Just one. Okay. Take it full screen, madam. Uh, good evening, uh, Professor Punamutreja. Uh, Punamutreja, Dr. Ravi Dugdal, Dr. Mala Ramanathan and the team member of IPRI, uh, basically Arjun Kumar and Ritika uh, for inviting me as well as asking me to present the NFHS scenario. Uh, although at, at present I am not coordinator of NFHS, but my institute uh, do this, all these surveys. So we are involved in that. And I was coordinator for DLHS for round three but I am not coordinator, so this uh, you clearly did. But uh, as an institute who 
all of us are involved in the activities of NFHS, so we are quite familiar with it. Uh, as uh, Professor Vibhuti Patel said, that uh, I should give a little overview of NFHS. So just uh, uh, let me show you the uh, primary objective. What was the primary objective when NFHS started in late 80s? The primary objective was to, one minute, yeah. Uh, the primary objective uh, of the NFHS was to uh, give essential data on health and family welfare program. This was the first objective of this thing. And with that, it has started. And afterwards, as it has been said by Professor Vibhuti Patel, we have included prevalence of malnutrition, anemia, hypertension, HIV, and uh, high blood glucose levels also. Mainly the purpose when it has been started in the late 80s was that uh, this data set should be used by the health sector to examine ongoing programs as well as setting up benchmark, which program is working, which program is not working, and how to improve. So looking at objective as well as the work, if anybody will see there is nothing in this objective as well as the uh, in 1980s, uh, any word about gender, okay? So just I wanted to tell you that gender was not the main objective of this survey. Although afterwards, what happened when people started questioning why people are not, women are not using family planning, why there is a violence, why this is uh, all those things are there, then gender questions were added in NFHS. And it was to explain about the fertility behavior, it, to explain about the family planning use, also to explain about ANCK, delivery care, and all those things. It is the byproduct of what was going on, and it has been added as a byproduct of this thing. So if you look at all the rounds, nowhere it is mentioned that we are giving gender uh, variables, but information on gender is also available. What is the main difference between census and NFHS? So this was the confusion people have in their mind. They treat uh, surveys as census. No, it is not. In census, what we do, may, all of you may be the, uh, very much familiar with uh, the census and uh, survey difference, but this is for general public who uh, are attending this uh, panel discussion. For them, I want to tell you that this, there is a method de facto de zero where uh, people are counted at the same place on reference date and people are also counted on usual residence. So in census, uh, local enumerators collect the data for three weeks. It's not just one or uh, two weeks. Mostly teachers in the uh, locality, in the locality, in the same locality, and they update the list till the survey, the census date is completed. They update the list, it means birth are also added, death are also added, and they visit several times to the household if information is not complete. And in census, what happened? We are collecting information on household population. We are also collecting information from institutional population. Institutional population means hostels, army people, or hotels, all those people who are living in different college hostels, all the hostels, uh, all the places where people are staying, that information is also collected. So this is a extra thing, institutional population. And also on the last day, houseless population, those who are living on the platforms or those who are living under the bridges and roads, they are also counted. And census is giving information in the form of tables, mostly in the form of table. And these are available till village or ward level. So this is beauty of the census that it is collected for a long period of time and it is covering everybody, okay? And NFHS, NFHS have a different methodology. This is a sample-based uh, data, sample-based data. And this is only for households, households where people are available. So here, D0 method is used only usual residents. And one extra thing is their uh, visitors are also counted. Okay, and coverage of this thing, NFHS is only household. 
in the institutional population is not there, houseless population is not there. Whereas in SRS, institutional population is also taken into account basically to uh, get information about deaths. Okay, so uh, in NFHS only household population is there. And estimates are available for, uh, till district level now in NFHS 4, NFHS 5, till district level. Previously, it was only for state level. And some of the indicators still uh, are also available only for um, state level, that is domestic violence, male health. Uh, the other beauty of NFHS is that individual level data is available. Anybody can use it, uh, download it, use it, analyze it. So this, is, this has freedom uh, to people to analyze in a different manner, but they should understand what is the purpose, at what level I can use this data set and how I can analyze. Whereas if you go for a single individual level data from census, it will be available, but under different conditions, all those things, and it, you have to pay for that. For, whereas NFHS thing, it is free. So use of NFHS data is much more than census nowadays. Nowadays it has become much more than census because it is av easily available. Anybody can download and use it raw data. Other one is about, when we talk about uh, sex ratio, you, you can think about uh, in 19, uh, the first round of NFHS, in the first round of NFHS, sex ratio was given as 944. And at that time in 1991, the sex ratio was 927. 927. It was much higher than what was existing. But at that time, people have not said anything because many of the people who were using uh, NFHS are those who have developed, they were demographers. Nowadays, what happened, NFHS data is in public domain, journalists are using it, other researchers are also using it. So different people are interpreting the data in a different manner. So at that time also, it was much higher than the existing census data sex ratio. In NFHS 4 also, it was 991, 991, but it was much above than the reported one. And you look at the states where it was above uh, 1,000, it was Bihar, Jharkhand, Chhattisgarh, Uresa, uh, Himachal, Uttarakhand, Kerala, Tamil Nadu, and Andhra Pradesh. In NFHS now, at All India level also, it has crossed 1,000. And these are the states where it has crossed 1,000. And what you can see, because UP also is showing more than 1,000, All India figure had gone up uh, more than 1,000. and if you look at this uh, states, these all these states are out migrating states, uh, and these states are showing about one thousand this thing, and whereas the state which are in migrating state, for example, Maharashtra, or you can take Delhi, or you can take uh, Gujarat, Punjab, uh, Punjab also have different type of problems, but all these states are much below one thousand level. What happened in NFHS, as I have already mentioned to you, that in NFHS, institutional population is not covered. That is primarily males. When you look at army or hostels and all those things, primarily male. The second one is in urban areas, response rate of uh, households is lower than the rural area. And in this state, basically in Delhi, uh, Maharashtra, Gujarat, and all those things, response rate is lower than the other states. And maybe this is because of locked household. And here, when there is a single member, and they will not be able to uh, get data within three, four days. So these are also not covered. So these males are also not covered, as well as household population, institutional population is also not there. That's why uh, what we are getting it is very high sex ratio in favor of females we are getting. But if you look at the projected population given by Registrar General till uh, 2036, the sex ratio is coming out as 952. Although we do not have 
census at present, which was supposed to be done by now, uh, 2021, but uh, because of all these problems, the pandemic problems, we have not conducted this. But if you take the projected population, from that also it is coming 952. And most likely that 2051, one also women will not outnumber males. So look at this thing out. But this scenario of sex ratio is changing. Why it is changing? It is increasing in favor of females. Because of lower mortality among females, uh, female have lower mortality in comparison to male. And the life expectancy difference is coming out as three years, three years more life expectancy. Previously, women have uh, lower life expectancy than male, but now life expectancy has also increased for females. Uh, apart from this, uh, infant mortality, difference between male and female infant mortality is also diminishing. Now it's only one point difference, 30 and 31. So, uh, on the whole, it is going to increase, but it may not be outnumbered. So it, is, it will not be more than 1,000 in any way. And uh, if you look at the sex ratio at birth, that has shown an improvement. However, what happened, this is for five years, but the, this uh, sex ratio at birth is from the five year children, it means the children who are born from this point to last five years. So this gives a, average of five years. But when you want exactly this um, enable by sex ratio at birth, it will be better to use SRS. SRS people, they never give overall sex ratio, but they give sex ratio at birth, the coverage uh, is good. And they have a dual record system, they visit twice, and they collect from the service provider as well as household service. And the next point which I wanted to show you is about the uh, nutrition indicators. So first we have talked about the sex ratio. The second one is uh, nutrition, this thing. Uh, what is happening in nutrition when we'll take only BMI? Uh, in BMI, there are two components, underweight and overweight. Underweight had slightly decreased, but whereas overweight had increased. The other very striking phenomena is that when you take 15 to 49 female and 15 to 49 males, the anemia level is much higher among female in comparison to males. This is striking and this requires something more. And not only for 15 to 49, when we take 15 to 19 also age group, which have not undergone pregnancies and all other things, many of them, uh, maybe unmarried and all those things. But for them also, there is a big difference between male and female, this thing. Now, I have shown this in a graphical manner. Underweight and overweight problem is only one third, whereas anemia among 15 to 49, you can take it as a one third, and among 15 to 19 as a one third. But in this group also, you can see the male male area is le much less in comparison to females. So the main problem area is female, whether you take 15 to 19, or if you take uh, 15 to 19 or 15 to 14, and both the things are big problem. Whereas in uh, overweight or underweight differences among male and female are negligible, not very significant. Whereas the differences between anemia among male and female are quite significant. And th this one is about the education. We, and this is not from NFHS, but I want to show all of you that uh, the percentage of uh, illiterate people in our population is much higher than what we are talking about. In 20 to 24, you can say more than 30% uh, are illiterate. And they are after 10 years, now they may be about 30 to uh, 34 years. You can think about around 40, approaching 40% 40 are illiterate. So in prime age, this many are illiterate. And what will happen to these people? It's 2020, uh, 2001 and 2011. 2011, uh, these people are a little less, but they are going to be illiterate in the future. So this will continue for a long period of time. So what we show, 
what this shows that we are not able to reach out to the female as well as male also are illiterate. It's not like that only female are illiterate, but male are also illiterate. We need to do something more for them. And when we look at uh, the NFHS data, because within four years, the marginal increase have been found for female. And that is good also. You can say that is good. 35.7 to 31% are reported to have 10 and more years of education. And in case of uh, male, it has been found from 47 to 50.2%. Uh, 50 so the difference between male and female are still 9% uh, in, here in education. And uh, uh, women who worked in the last 12 months, it uh, has marginally small increase has been found. And this may be because in an IHDS survey when Professor uh, Sonaldi Desai was talking about it, when you simply ask the question about uh, whether you have worked in 12 months, past 12 months, women may not report, but when you ask whether you have gone and helped your husband in the field, farm, or business, and all those things, if you ask those women, then they may report uh, that, uh, yes, they have worked it out. The other one is about women owning a house and our land alone or jointly. That has increased. This is a happy, positive sign, you can say. But most of the time, it has been found that parents have to have a big dowry. And this question, we need to also ask, further expand it, and ask whether they got the property or land from the parents or it is from the husband's side. So unless and until we get this thing from where she is getting it, it will not be very clear. And ever married women who have reported the spousal violence, uh, that has slightly decreased, but we need to examine who is reporting spousal violence, whether women are in their houses, when we go and ask them in their own houses, whether who have the courage to report that yes, they are going, uh, they are facing spousal violence. So that is very important thing, who is reporting and who is not reporting, that has to be examined. And the other one is about the solutions. What solutions we have for uh, spousal violence, domestic violence, we need to think about it. And the, based on all this, few indicators only I have taken it. So when people start talking about the surveys and uh, we need to keep in mind there are limitations. We cannot take the survey as a substitute for census. When people want to talk about the sex ratio, they can take projected population sex ratio and show it to you, not the NFHS data sex ratio, because it has limitation for gender uh, related indicators. And overall sex ratio always have to depend from census because it is covering all male population from different sectors, different places. And sex ratio is uh, sex ratio at birth. Let us try something new also, not necessarily surveys and all those things. Let us see birth registration, hospital data, HMIS is giving only government sector. So we can collect information from birth registration. We can collect data from the hospitals, which uh, monthly or weekly, ask them to display the number of male and female births. So that will be much more accurate than going by the surveys and all those things. What I feel that, uh, why so much difference? Maybe because we have behavior-wise differences are there. Maybe male are given much uh, better food or uh, food diversity is much better in case of males in comparison to females. That's why such a big difference is coming out. So uh, external programs will not help. Here we need to have more counseling, behavior change and all those things, then uh, it will be become. So many people say that girls should drop out from the school because there are no toilets. When we are running Swachh Bharat Mission, why can't we do something about school toilets or toilets in the institution? So there should be some mission to uh, have all the schools lay girls' toilets. And if uh, NGOs or all other sector come out and say that, yes, we want to school, uh, toilets in the uh, schools. So it is possible when we are talking about uh, so many houses have toilets. So it's, why can't we have toilets in the school? The other one is that not necessarily that all the girls will go to graduation, post-graduation, the regular courses. They, they need <coughs> educational courses. 
and this vocational courses availability should be there in the small towns what, what is happening only in the capital city of the state this courses will be available and parents do not want to spend so much money on the education of uh, girls because they say that we also have to invest for uh, or maybe collect the amount for the dowry how we can spend her uh, uh, on education so this is one uh, uh, problem with the parents also family investment for education of girls is less in comparison to the parents and connectivity and uh, colleges so many if you look at many small towns and all those private sector people are not going they are not establishing so at least government or maybe some incentive with some incentives private colleges can be started in this thing uh, at present we cannot give uh, uh, employment to all the women but uh, unless and until we involve in some financial or ec economic activity they will not be independent and they will not report the violence they will not be uh, have autonomy to come out from the house and go to the police station and report the so unless and until they are independent they will not be able to do anything so for this purpose at least involvement of them in the sgs and the activities uh, related with this sgs will help them so we have seen this sgs involvement in uresa bihar chatisgarh and women are quite uh, empowered in those places and they are doing a lot of job so with this i want to stop it here thank you very much Professor Said Unisa, for thank you for such a detailed presentation and also explaining the difference between the data for, for census and a survey. And uh, also, uh, we are going to have a set, uh, last round on way forward, but you have covered that also. And all the processes of NFHS you have explained. Now, I would like to ask another. Uh, uh, demographer and especially uh, she is also the alumnus of uh, IIPS and uh, with a technical expertise on uh, NFS the statistical aspects. So, Professor Mala Ramnathan, people also say that more men have died than women under COVID, uh, and there is a whole phenomena of COVID widows. Maharashtra alone uh, has some more than 12,000 COVID widows and COVID orphans. Can, uh, can that also be one of the reasons for uh, favorable sex ratio of ed among the adults? Uh, another, well, the important question that I want to ask you is about the total fertility rate of India has declined from 2.2 in 2015-16 to 2% 2 in a period of 2019-21. Uh, what are the possible implications for the gendered nature of contraceptive responsibility in this? And second question is that the reports of spousal violence indicate a marginal decline and its prevalence from 31.2% of every of ever married women aged in the age group of say 18 to 49 uh, to say it is reduced to 29.3 percent in 2019-21 while the data from the women's organizations and the experiences of state commissions for women and uh, national commission for women talks otherwise that it has increased the spousal violence has increased now this evidence comes in the context of reports of increased domestic violence during the period uh, from several sources civil society organizations and the government bodies now is this decline in report of spousal violence reliable and how do you see the, this in the context of increase in the indicators of women's empowerment yes dr malara Thank you, Dr. Vibhuti, and uh, thank you, all, uh, Saida, for this very comprehensive uh, detailing of the NFHS because it really helps to lay to rest a lot of, uh, what shall I say, sometimes really unnecessary remarks and conjecture involving um, NFHS and its use. And, you know, going hammer and tongs at things which in terms of our comparing apples and oranges at times. But, you know, you can shout yourself hoarse, but some people, it's very difficult because one, as technical experts, we don't really have the exact language in which to 
start a discourse and the second part is to be very honest to some part we get tired and we kind of give up both i think are in a sense reprehensible and we need to overcome and i'm so glad that you know iips has started because we outside are tired of yelling ourselves hoarse saying you can't do this you can't do that no it can't etc so said i'm so glad iips is coming out in these places and talking in order to you know clarify and that is extremely important step which has happened i think thanks to covid because it used to be only dissemination workshops okay. so i'm so happy to see you said explaining with such clarity and so simply so thank you because you can see there are 51 people and is going to be heard by many more uh, dr vibhuti coming to the other question on whether the mortality look even at the mortality levels if in the first phase they could have been far more you know so that should have shown up 14 states are in the second phase now the merge rates are what you are looking at in terms of uh, the sex ratio so you know adult mortality even after covid no matter how high it would have been given the base population which is involved in this the you know moving of the sex ratio takes huge numbers because it is like 2927 per 1000 so you know moving the census sex ratio or a sample survey which is this large with only male mortality excess male mortality which covid has thrown up alone may not be the possible reason the possible reason is coming from these things that the lack of institutional population in in uh, the surveys and um houseless that is almost entirely male that could be another reason the other one could have been the variation that has come due to the migrant nature of people who couldn't move in phase 1 and the people who moved out in phase 2 when you merge these two also it could have resulted so that those explanations need to be sought by making a comparative analysis which only when the data comes out we will know but it's a bit premature to you know uh, climb up a bandwagon and say sex ratio has declined or increased or anything on the basis of just this data what we need to use this data is to talk about things like the total fertility rate talk about its gender implications which are phenomenal huge things like when you look at your your asking about the gender based violence and the marginal decline and said might throw up a little bit more information on this but you look at the way data collection happens you know in the times when we are not in situations like covid now imagine a household where a woman is sitting in and probably 9 to 5 kind of data collection timings unless you get an appointment later most of the men are not there some women are there there is reasonable privacy to answer questions there is a better chance of people answering it you know with the open heart abhi in the post covid scenario or in the covid children you remember during data collection the schools were not open the children would have been milling around any number of people would have been milling around how can i say it would have been easier to say na and get rid of the whole option so that is another factor we need to also envisage the context in which see we try for privacy aim for privacy uh, but it is very difficult to achieve in reality you aim for a modicum of privacy but you cannot prevent people milling around and that could have also affected reporting in bringing stuff down because the other evidence which is through telephone you know helplines other things tells us it has not come down 
So I would, and the other thing is of all the empowerment indicators, employment has not shown anything more than a marginal increase. And as Dr. Saidunisa herself has pointed out, that is, it may give rise to a backlash, but if it is a sufficient sustained period, is likely to marginally bring down and slowly bring it down, which we have seen in our work in rural Tamil Nadu and other places in the past. The initial phase of you know, women stepping out of the threshold is actually not decline, is actually slight increase. And it is subsequent of sustained effort at work that brings it down. So that is one place where I would you know, reanalyze the data with great care to look at places, you know, and when I interpret, I would look at phase one, hai ki phase two, hai, et cetera, with great care. But that is not to say that with all, you know, in any survey, we assume errors are random. And the patterns will not be affected. Levels may be. So I would still accept the patterns that it throws. But coming to TFR, which is my pet uh, topic, I want to share my screen with all of you. And uh, yes, it's on, ma'am. Yeah, so you need to understand that whatever I say here and have said has no, this is a disclaimer I need to say, does not represent those of the OP institutions I belong. And my two PhD students helped me with data compilation here. And it's the decline in TFR has gone from 2.2 to 2. And this falls below the required TFR for the net reproduction rate, which was discussed way back in 1980 population policy and is still part of the objectives of our current population policy of 2000, where immediate objective of net uh, national population, uh, the unmet needs of contraception, it talks about everything, healthcare infrastructure, health personnel to provide integrated service delivery for basic reproductive and child health care. Medium term objective is to bring the TFR to replacement levels, that is 2.1, with vigorous implementation of intersectoral operational strategies. Long term objective is stable population by 2045 at a level consistent with sustainable economic growth, social development, etc. But the target was the TFR, you know, bringing it down with the NRR, that is net reproduction rate of one, the T allied TFR is 2.1. Now we can achieve it with different levels of TFR, but this TFR was the one which we designated. Now look at the declines in the TFR across different places. Almost everywhere the TFR is below the, in the requirement of 2.1 or 2.1 itself, not above. It's only Bihar, Jharkhand, Manipur, Meghalaya, UP that have achieved uh, less uh, a TFR which is higher than 2.1. Th this is what is represented by the gaps. Otherwise, you can see more or less the red and the blue lines the blue line comes below because it is a recent TFR. They are almost running parallel. And uh, you can see the red line is above very few places. Do you see high TFRs, Bihar with three, and I think UP with 2.4, and that itself is a decline if you look at where it was earlier. So, you know, you look at the decline in the total fertility rate, Kerala and Tamil Nadu have actually gone from 1.6 to 1.8 and from 1.8 to 2.4. But you have to remember that it is a historical precedent that exists with thermographic transition with very low fertilities. The fertility levels tend to fluctuate a year wise. So that is what this demonstrates. The TFRs of Kerala and Tamil Nadu have been below replacement for close to more than a decade now. The interesting part is the use of modern methods of contraception, even though it's only a four-year gap. You see a universal rise when you can see 
everywhere, almost everywhere, that the red line, that is the recent NFHS, this is only modern methods. So almost everywhere, the red line is above the blue line. You contraceptive use, particularly female sterilization, male sterilization, IUCDs, postpartum and otherwise, condoms, oral pills, in and injectables, which are all reported, have gone up over this period. You know, except few union territories like Mizoram and Ch Chandigarh and Punjab. Barring these, almost everywhere contraceptive use, modern method use has gone. Now, which is a remarkable achievement, finding that the NFHS has thrown up 56.5 is the rate for among women in reproductive ages for all India. However, now this is the gendered comment. If you look at what contraceptives were used and to what extent they were used, please look at how many of you can discern any black component in my bars. I put them as black so that so as to render them absolutely visible if they exist, and in large parts, they are non-existent. And when it exists, it's invisible. A large part of it is the deep blue shade, to which is graph. totally female sterilization. And then the gray component is the IUD. The red component is the oral pill. But what is interesting in the recent period is the rise in condom use throughout urban India phenomenal increase in condoms usage in urban India. But I'm wary of interpreting it merely as, you know, a contraceptive use. It could be also a disease prevention mechanism. But in order to not to discredit it, men are taking responsibility for disease prevention, if not for pregnancy prevention. So that is taking responsibility in, you know, the number of blue lines, dark blue lines I have is a remarkable characteristic that the NFHS 5 has thrown up, which is to be, you know, we need to uh, enhance this in the coming years through mechanisms to facilitate, you know, may, more male taking responsibility. If you look at modern methods of contraception, which have gone up everywhere, use of modern methods have also gone up systematically over the two periods of time, as I said earlier, decline in fertility, modern methods, total fertility rate, then you have, sorry, the use of modern methods, which has gone up, contraceptive use, female responsibility, if you look at. I computed this as, I removed injectables because I didn't have enough states with data for the NFHS score. So I again computed the, pro, the contraceptives, the rates for female contraception, uh, that is sterilization, oral pills, and IUCDs, to the total use of contraceptives, and computed that as female responsibility for contraception. And what you see is, a slight decline, the red lines have gone down. And this I can tell you because I have looked at it individually as well, is almost totally the contribution of urban condom use. If you see the red line represents the, in the index of female responsibility for contraception has come down in the re recent NFHS. What it means, is that men have stepped up and taken some responsibility. But it can also but, be that contraceptives were not available during the pandemic of 18. It could be, but it is condom use has actually gone up systematically over so many states. And that is what is this representing because, but it is a more, it has increased partly in rural areas and very significantly in our developments. So it, and regardless of phase one, phase two. Yeah. Okay. yeah. So that is what I think is 
something which is a bit heartening, but you know, I'm still, I would have liked that to have been the contribution of male sterilization as well. But that is something I will come to now in my way. The gendered story of your the fertility decline, largely still a woman responsibility. Male responsibility is marginal, but increasing with more men, as I mentioned, using condoms, particularly in urban areas. So rather than, you know, this overwhelming targeting of women for contraceptive use, we need to start focusing programmatic effort. If we have to accept the NFHS and the near universal pattern that is emerging in condom use is telling us that the time is ripe, you know, rather than uh, going back to the same demand side women and uh, targeting women, we need to, you know, Women have taken dual responsibility for reproductive work. Biologically, they cannot, you know, stop taking responsibility for childbearing. But the work of child stopping childbearing also has to be only women. That is gender. Is because childbearing is biological. Why not shift the other part of the work and make it to be shared by men? And they are taking some responsibility. So we need to strengthen that. Because see, if you take, when it came to vaccine for COVID, we all went around asking yeah. questions about bullets yeah. like uh, um, vaccines So why not ask the question, how many doctors are capable of providing vasectomy? What is the facility available for providing vasectomies? How much of effort is going into talking those things? How many condoms are available for distribution in the places? Because unmet need is 9.4 even now. Yeah. Part of it is for spacing. It has come down. So men are taking responsibility. We need to work, staff, promotional efforts, all of that. Because policy efforts should enable responsible reproductive work. That reproductive work, which is gender balanced, and that which enables men to take up contraceptive responsibility as well. And that means also focusing because it's very little. We've been doing totally demand side work with very minimal work on supply side focus. And we need to start looking at that in terms of training, staffing patterns, not just this sporadic camps for you know no scalpel vasectomy, but a concerted systematic effort which caters to needs if they emerge. And we have to create that felt need as well. And that is the, because the TFR seems to have been, has declined. Your demographic nirvana is totally on the bodies of women. So isn't it time men were enabled to, you know, take responsibility if that is a feature and that is the gendered story of the TFR. Thank you, Professor Mala Ramathan, for giving such a comprehensive and statistically empowered presentation and also explaining the special circumstances under which data collection was done uh, uh, for NFHS, unpacking NRR1 and also st the state-wise uh, state, uh, state differentiation of TFR and ending with the responsible reproductive work. I think extra well, well done, very, very erudite presentation. Now I would like to ask uh, Ms. Puram Mutreja, that uh, what do you have to say about the NFHS stealing result on spousal violence when a significant number of men and women in 13 out of 18 states have justified wife beating, saying it is all right if a man hits his, a woman, if number one, she does, she argues with him, if she goes out of house without telling him, if she neglects the house and or children, if she shows disrespect for in-laws, and if she refuses to have sex with him, if she doesn't cook food properly, and if she he suspects her of being unfaithful. How do you interpret this data about spousal okay. violence? Yes. Ma'am, please unmute yourself, Puna ma'am. Uh, thank you, Vibhuti, and thank you to you and Imprey for inviting me. And this, these were two great presentations. 
full of rich data and which we can build on. Uh, I want to say, uh, Vibhuti, first that I think NFHS has made a huge contribution. I think it was NFHS 3 which introduced the um, data on violence. And I believe that it not only put violence more strongly on the agenda in the country, but these reasons that you're giving, you know, um, um, which uh, NFHS has brought out in three, four, and five. In fact, it, you know, when you were reading out the list, I was very, I was getting very sadly amused, not happily amused, that you can find any reason to beat a woman. So, you know, I can imagine a man listing another uh, 50 um, <laughs> um, points for uh, reasons for... <coughs> Uh, violence. And we also, let's not forget, it's not just the men, but even the women, a very, very close number, um, uh, believe that um, um, it is legitimate for a man or a partner to beat them under uh, those very, almost those, all of those circumstances. So first, I want to say is, you know, what it indicates. Um, and the first time when I heard the NFHS data, was the first time we knew the large percentage of women who also believe shocking numbers for men, but equally shocking for women. And my response to that was then, and it is today that women not only carry the burden of procreation, um, childcare, family planning, but also maintaining patriarchy. You know, women have been trained, uh, uh, socialized, and our social norms are such that it is women too, it's not just men and men also, it's part of social norms, all these beliefs. Yes. So um, that is one. Number two, I do want to uh, say that um, you have to declare war when there is a situation like this. It's, it's, it's epidemic proportion, the amount of violence that is not only practiced, but legitimized. And by the way, I do want to mention that um, there is something, I have enormous respect for IAPS, their um, methodology, data collection. So the comments I'm going to make are not on, on um, uh, NFHS and IAPS. My comment is more on women's inability to respond. Like I think you mentioned nine to five is when the survey happens. But at least for the second phase, women were um, in the house uh, with their perpetrators. How were they going to answer uh, a question? And when we knew at the same time violence was increasing, also through the helplines, not just anecdotal evidence and um, uh, NGOs and others who work on these issues, but we knew it'll increase. And it was a global phenomenon. Why will India stay behind? The patriarchal India will probably be ahead of the rest of the world where violence increased across the world. So India, there is no reason to believe, especially when women were um, 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 locked in with their per 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 perpetrators and nowhere to go and men who didn't have access to alcohol, access to going out, stepping out, their frustration came out on the women and that data is available from helplines. Uh, so uh, we cannot trust, uh, we, no, not trust, we cannot accept this data and we have to uh, do something to come to a better conclusion and better figures, better numbers and do something about it. Secondly, you know, um, as long as public health will not accept violence um, 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 as a part of their response, violence is going to, uh, is, is something very difficult to deal with because who in the villages, who are the women who get in, uh, they come into contact with? It's really the public health system, the frontline workers they don't come into contact with police and others. And we have, many of us have tried very hard and I think we need to work and campaign first of all on uh, do advocacy on 
it, um, a, a violence, a public health response to violence. And that is true for 80 countries across the world. So why not India? And um, I wrote a paper for the ministry, which I'll share with you all later to take this forward. Second, uh, uh, you know, a third of the ever married uh, 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 women aged between 18 and 49 reported uh, um, spousal yes. violence, and only 1.5% of women aged between 18 and 29 reported experiencing sexual violence. You know, it's unbelievable yes. because younger girls experience more sexual violence, unmarried girls, newly married, uh, within the family, outside the family. So there is, you know, we have to find a better way. This is cute data, and we have to find a better way of doing these surveys or a different way. And is NFHS the right survey? Though I'm, I'm saying I'm very grateful to NFHS for bringing out, uh, for, for starting uh, collecting data on violence. And this disparity also indicates significant underreporting of sexual violence, not just domestic and other forms of violence against minors as well. The changes reported in yes, NFHS yes. 5 are marginal and greater efforts needed, are needed to address the social and cultural norms around these, um, these issues. And I think this is an opportunity for academics uh, across the country to think about doing um, survey studies, and we also need a large uh, survey. So this is an opportunity, I would like to say the conundrum and the questions that have come out um, on this. And my, uh, apart from um, um, uh, 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 violence being seen, uh, violence uh, to be seen as a um, uh, public health issue uh, or considered a public health issue, this is an area we need huge amount of behavior change communication. And uh, it is with the, I say that with a lot of responsibility, experience and confidence that it works, behavior change while uh, communication works. When I say experience, nobody should assume that I'm beaten at home, no way. I'd probably beat up the guy. <laughs> no, I'm, so it's not a personal experience, but my work experience, if I can quickly share with you, you know, we, we have this serial, which has had 103 seasons and 182 episodes um, on Doordarshan. And we did evaluation, external evaluation of each of these uh, seasons, uh, three seasons. And in season one, you know, our baseline showed actually, um, uh, while NFHS had shown 52% um, and 54% women uh, and men um, uh, acknowledging uh, violence, but our survey, our baseline showed 62 and 64, uh, 62 and 64%. Uh, people indicating that they practice violence and also implement, uh, also um, legitimizing, sorry, violence. And in first 52 episodes, uh, we were shocked because 20% less people after 52 episodes, respondents after 52 episodes um, uh, said they are, uh, you know, violence is wrong, their perception change, all right, um, uh, and that it is not legitimate. So I actually didn't believe it. So we called a global expert to India uh, to come and who's an expert on evaluating behavior change um, uh, from Texas University to reassess, to look at our questionnaires, look at our, uh, not our questionnaires, the evaluation questionnaires, look at the data, look at the analysis. And he came back to us after 10 days of he and his team sitting with the experts and um, the people who had done the evaluation and came to our office and said, and this was particular data I wanted him to look at. He said to us, stand on the rooftop and say, we did it. Then I said, all right, I still didn't feel confident Vibhuti saying publicly that we had made such a huge impact. So I looked at data on behavior change communication related to violence for Africa and many other parts of the country on entertainment, education. And guess what? It was true. And then season two, I'm not going to share the data with you. I just want to share an anecdote. We read in a small village, uh, sorry, district newspaper that in Bundelkhand, which is, as you all know, 
is one of the most backward areas. There is a group of men who have started a men's movement. Mala will be very happy though. I'm going to disagree with some of the analysis and positivity Mala brought out about men, but Mala will be very happy to hear what I'm saying about men here. So the, the, there's a group of men from one particular village, a start Chhatarpur village in Bundelkhand, started a movement by taking a pran, as they call it, a vow, that they will not practice any form of violence, sexual, mental, physical, because you had all aspects of the violence in it, not just physical violence or sexual violence, that they, they took a pran, they will not do it. And they went around different villages and got men to join the movement, other men, three men from Chhatarpur started. And let's go further. They said two other things they took a pran on that they will help the child rearing and they will do vasectomy and they did do vasectomy. So we read this article and we didn't believe it quite honestly, Mala. So we sent a team of people, a communication team to see if this was true. And then we made a film on the men of Chhatarpur and we had a concert in Bombay where we gave them an award a few years later. So um, behavior change does work. So I really wanna push for behavior change, communication. And uh, finally, uh, we need more data, absolutely. And we need more responses. Yeah. And I believe, I want to say here that today for a woman who experiences violence, it's very difficult to find people for them, homes to send them to. I don't know where our feminist NGOs have gone. There are hardly any NGOs that work on violence against women in terms of not people like us also. I'm not doing anything for women who experience violence, but uh, that's not our role. We never said it was, but the NGOs that worked on it, some have disappeared or ended their work. Is it because there isn't funding? Is it because it's overwhelming? There's too much violence, but there are huge problems we need to deal with. Yeah. I think uh, we had similar experience even in uh, Mumbai, Dharavi, that behavior change communication. I think, thank you for highlighting that. My second question to you is that, do financial inclusion, having bank account, which has gone up according to NFHS uh, from 53% to 78%, ownership of mobile phones, or women taking part in family decisions imply empowerment? Or is it happening because of certain government initiatives which require women to avail these services for the benefit of household? For example, Jandan account, no, which were yeah. opened by, yeah. yeah. So first, I'd like to say, Vibhuti, that all these issues need to be looked at separately. You know, uh, financial inclusion, uh, 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 ownership of uh, 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 cell phones, etc. Definitely, the government Jandhan Yojana may have led to only an increase in the number of women holding bank accounts. I don't believe that's led to any form of financial empowerment, economic, uh, uh, economic, they're not flourishing economically or doing better economically. And it, it's a feel good factor um, for women to have a bank account, I will not deny and to get some money from the uh, 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 government in the name of our Prime Minister under the Jandhan Yojana is a very good political strategy for the uh, 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 ruling party. But for the women, it's the, if I if I were to rate on hundred uh, uh, the the government gets or the political leadership gets hundred on hundred for doing this, well, women get maybe not more than five uh, uh, in a hundred benefits. So I want to be very clear on that. Yeah, um, uh, that's one uh, uh, number two. But 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 I like the idea, and I think we have to welcome the bank accounts being open. We can't just trash it, right? Uh, but owning a mobile phone has become today a necessity, necessity and does not necessarily imply empowerment, but we can use it. We can use the fact that women do have telephones and X number of women have to have telephones. We can use that to really uh, reach information, behavior change, communication and other forms of information information and if we have helplines which can be whose numbers can be put on the women's phones we can help we can you know going ahead whether it's government or ngos or communication people 
we can really empower women. It is a tool which can be used to share information, empower women, remind them if they're on a pill that they need to take a pill or if they are on injectable, we can remind them after three months. I can think of a hundred ways to empower women using phone. Now, I also want to warn us that there'll be plenty of people and I'm fed up of all those people who question me because we use telephone and digital technology a lot to reach young people and women so people say, oh, but girls have fewer phones than men. It is true. But if you look at the numbers, they are huge in terms of how much impact we can make. Let's not just be frustrated about the fact that there is a digital divide. More boys and men have phones compared to girls and, uh, girls and women. But the numbers are huge. Second, I'd like to say, so let's not waste our time only. We must take care of the digital divide, but let's use this as an opportunity that there are a large number of women who have cell phones. Number three, I'd like to say that um, girls typically, and again, I don't have, I, 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 I don't have uh, data. I'm only telling you since we work with young people, our experiences, girls especially, um, you share phones, you know, if one girl sees some information, she will share it with other girls. There's much more sharing amongst girls than uh, uh, boys. But amongst the girls too, you know, even phones, girls do manage to take the brother's phone, mother's phone, father's phone in use. So they may not own a phone, but let's not discount the potential of uh, reaching girls using phone. And we do know from research, Shireen's work and other people's work that girls um, do, I mean, it is peers, it is their peers, both girls and boys, but much more for girls, they, much of the information they receive is from the peers. So just like, you know, in newspapers and magazines, we don't look at how many magazines are sold or how many newspapers are sold, we see readership. Readership can be a hundred if it's a library. So similarly, we should try and get a handle and understand what is the, how many people use and how many people the information from cell phones use. You know, when we go to villages, we find one girl with a cell phone and 20 girls surrounding all of us have seen that. So it is an empowerment in itself, I would like to say, um, in, but it's not automatic. It's like the demographic dividend. Unless and we now invest the in NFHS 5 also says decision-making power of women, the percentage of women with uh, it has gone up. So yes. I think that we need to unpack through, I think some uh, area studies and qualitative uh, research also. Absolutely. And also, you know, reaching out See, we know one and another thing that has happened is, and I think much of the fertility also and women using more contraceptives is to do not so much with what the family planning program has done. It has to do with aspirations Aspiration. of um, um, women and families have changed. And that could also be the uh, reason why uh, there are many reasons uh, condoms, if you allow me to speak, um, <laughs> condoms have increased. It's partly, it's not that men have become more responsible, but may, uh, uh, how can they become more, we, we say because condom use, they become responsible. Why aren't they being responsible on use of um, vasectomy when vasectomy has become so easy? Now we have fixed day services for sterilization. They don't even have to go to camps. So therefore, I'm, I'm not going to be as kind to men, Mala, as you. And it is a necessity also today for people to have That's two smart. children or less than two children, because look at the cost food price index. You know, never mind what they say about inflation, but uh, five and six, but for food inflation, uh, Ravi is an eco uh, a health economist and he's an economist. He'll be able to tell us better. But I, like a foolish non-economist, might even say it's gone up by hundreds of percent food prices. People can't afford to feed their children. And then finally, whether it's the men or the women, but primarily the women and girls, their aspirations have totally changed. In fact, I always attribute that to the success of Meg Ujbikar Satyu and NFHS uh, the positive things NFHS is showing is not because we've done a lot invested in women and girls. Yes, education has helped. Literacy is a great 
um, contraceptive pill, but much of everything we are discussing has to do with the changing aspirations. And those changing aspirations have come from the exposure girls and women have to uh, communication, not just behavior change communication, but information in general. So the other half, I always say, is know how the better half lives now, and they want to aspire. We have fewer children, we invest in their education, we are investing in girls' education, and so on and so forth. So um, communication and telephone becomes a very powerful tool, an empowering tool, and going forward, let's plan for that. Yeah. Thank you, Madamji, for such an erudite presentation about on domestic violence and sharing your uh, ground level experiences. Now uh, it is turn for Ravi Dukkar. And how do you view certain encouraging trends such as higher institutional deliveries, decrease in underage marriages, increase in of hygienic methods during menstruation period. And some say that uh, changes are marginal and need bigger push for all stakeholders. What do you have to say? Please unmute yourself. Yeah. Ravi sir, please unmute yourself. Yeah. Bottom left. Yeah, the mic. Yes. Sorry, sorry. Yeah. Uh, what? Thanks, Vibhuti. Uh, what uh, you said, I mean, in terms of the improvements that one sees, I mean, they are marginal. I mean, so there's nothing great to talk about it in FHS 5. Uh, being very different for what we saw in NFHS 4. In fact, if you actually look even further down, you'll see that the improvements in from NFHS 3 to 4 are much higher. Yes, it's a 10 year period, but if you factor it in terms of uh, gain in points, I mean, it was much more. And I think there somewhere the credit does go to NRHM, at least where health uh, uh, indicators uh, are, are concerned. But that apart, uh, I think if we move at this pace in terms of improvement, we're not going to reach anywhere at the SDG targets uh, for most of these uh, health and nutrition uh, indicators. Uh, that, that's very clear. I mean, this pace of uh, improvement, and this doesn't happen because our healthcare system, I want to focus mainly on health, uh, yeah. healthcare services and partly nutrition. Uh, the, the kind of healthcare system that we have. Uh, at one level, we have a public health system, which is very weak, underfunded. Uh, we are spending only around 1% of GDP. Though the recent national health accounts claim 1.35%, but that's jugglery. And this government is quite very uh, kind of uh, good at doing that. I mean, misrepresenting uh, the trends uh, as they did with employment figures and, and so on. So uh, uh, in, in terms of uh, the improvements that you see in health, I mean, they are not happening the way they should be happening because we have a weak uh, primary healthcare system, uh, both in rural and urban areas. Rural, urban areas are a little better off in terms of at least clinical care where you have hospitals and dispensaries and uh, more clinical care is available, but rural areas completely lack that. And, where the primary healthcare system delivers largely what we call preventive and promotive care, like immunization. And uh, even in immunization, I think we uh, there may be improvement over the last round, but uh, we don't really uh, see very, I mean, it's the kind of investment which has gone into immunization, we should, and, and the kind of technology available, we should be looking at 100% coverage. Uh, by this time, but uh, but uh, but we don't see in something like polio, which is such a consistent campaign. You know, the the, the on I think what one Sunday every month or two Sundays every month, whatever. Uh, yet, I mean, we are far far below uh, reaching universal immunization for polio. And the other for the others, less said the better because the total uh, immunization coverage is, is is very low. I mean, for all the basic. Uh, uh, vaccine. Is it worsened during pandemic? Uh, probably, because uh, if you look at uh, the data, which uh, the HMIS data, uh, of course, the data, there was a lag of availability of data. Data was not available for almost a year 
the, the quarterly reports which the HMIS gives. So we really don't know the, the latter part of 2020 and uh, early 2021. Now some data has come which just show uh, uh, reduced uh, usage of uh, public health services, like uh, even institutional deliveries has gone down, immunization has gone down, access to TB care has gone down. All, all public programs uh, which are there were impacted drastically and primarily because the funds of the healthcare system, the existing budget was being used for managing COVID care. Okay, so no new funds really came in. I mean, with all those PM care stuff, whatever, no real, it was actually just diversion of funds from existing programs. Because people, at least for, at least for at eight or nine months, I mean, utilization completely collapsed, not only in the uh, public sector, but for public health services, but even in the private health sector. People were not going to doctors or uh, hospitals because they were wary that they would catch infection and, and so on. So there was a massive impact in routine kind of, you could say, routine uh, seeking care for routine uh, ailments. So, so it was clear that uh, now whether NFHS reflects that because, again, it's interesting that you have one round of NFHS in few states, which was during the pandemic. And yeah, so it would be interesting to compare the two sets of uh, uh states which one pre-pandemic and one post i'm sure somebody will do that i mean i have to be frank i've only looked at the uh for nh nfhs5 the the uh, the fact sheet for india and, and maybe some of the states but uh, uh i know certain states uh, the first phase states the reports are available but uh i was not able to really look at that except a little bit of maharashtra so what i'm seeing is more from the fact sheet where the gendered aspect is concerned there's very little in the fact sheet which you can actually look at so i have, I have actually what i did was uh, kind of review the nfhs4 to understand uh, what kind of gendered uh, uh, understanding is emerging from uh, uh, the, the data that we see in terms of uh, health and uh, nutrition Yes, for, for nutrition, definitely there is in the fact sheet itself as a male-female uh, disaggregation, but uh, uh, to look at more details, so I, so I use the NFHS4. So what the, the comments that I'm making are largely based on what I see in NFHS4 and, and less of NFHS5 uh, unless that gender disaggregation is there in the fact sheet. So... Uh, uh, let, let's come to the specifics in terms of, say, maternal health or uh, indicators like uh, uh, Vibhuti asked about uh, institutional deliveries. Yes, there is improvement. I mean, and that, and that's been happening uh, maybe because of JSY uh, and, and other kind of schemes which are there. But that too, one sees that uh, various studies, micro studies have shown there's a whole lot of fraud also in that it actually uh, the money really doesn't reach uh, women. So it's an incentive which has encouraged uh, uh, institutional deliveries. And you see that in the figures, because even if you triangulate with NSSO data, you again see it there. So uh, yes, that's true. But uh, in terms of uh, services that uh, women get in terms of whether they're getting those benefits which are mandated, uh, that that's kind of uh, questionable. In terms of immunization, I've already said not not very significant improvement. Similarly, ANC uh, again not it's it's okay. I mean, it's just more or less uh, similar. If you factor in that uh, over a five year period, you should have had some significant changes. Uh, postnatal care is disappointing. I mean, in the sense that it's. Uh, uh, and, it, and that, that probably explains, I was just looking at some of the mortality, child mortality, infant mortality data. What is very interesting, uh, which I find is if you look at uh, 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 NFHS4 data, you find that uh, um, neonatal mortality, infant mortality, and under five mortality favors girls. I mean, maybe the difference is small, but it does favor girls. But interestingly, zero to four years, the child mortality rate and the post-neonatal mortality rate favors boys. 
So this is something interesting to kind of see why this is happening. I mean, because there are now factors uh, uh, which uh, play out in terms of the patriarchal nature of society, etc., neglect of girl children, etc. We'll probably explain that, but uh, this is something interesting to look at. Why, why, why is this kind of a gender difference? Uh, that is, David. Where is the the, the secular rate is uh, in, in favor of girls, uh, but but for these two indicators, why do you see uh, that it is better for uh, boys? So, uh, I mean, one has to deep dive into it. So I really can't explain it at this point of time, but maybe Mala or Sayudanisa may have some answers uh, uh, for that. In terms of uh, uh, In terms of healthcare, I mean, indicators, I think what I saw very positive in terms of, uh, of course, this is not there in the NFHS 5 fact sheet uh, about tuberculosis, but I looked at Maharashtra data and it fits the pattern of the NFHS 5. Uh, I think if you want to look at a good gendered analysis of a disease, TB in NFHS is very well done. And in terms of the kind of uh, the, the width and the uh, of, of our gender analysis, I think it's, it's it's exceptional. I mean, I found it very interesting. And what you see is between the NHS three and four, there's a huge change in uh, prevalence of tuberculosis, a huge increase for women, and a huge decline for men. I mean, uh, it needs an explanation for that, but it is it is it is huge. And uh, for example, if you uh, want the figures. It's uh, from NFHS uh, three to four, the increase for women was 309 per lakh to 389. So that's a pretty large increase. But for women, for men, there was a huge drop uh, from 526 in NFHS three to 220 in NFHS four. Difficult to believe that uh, men have such low uh, level of tuberculosis, especially in rural areas. It's more so in, in urban areas, there's a decline. Uh, I don't know what's the situation in NFHS 5. Uh, Maharashtra, I looked at Maharashtra state report, and there you do see the, a similar pattern, which you see for India in terms of uh, the uh, gender differences in uh, prevalence of TB. Uh, uh, the NFHS fact, five facts, she doesn't give the other health uh, 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 data. Uh, uh, if you look at, uh, uh, let me go to uh, uh, nutrition. Okay, this is, this is uh, a, a catastrophic territory. I mean, uh, India's performance on the nutrition front, it's highly debated and uh, even independent of NFHS, there's enough evidence to show that uh, uh, we are not doing well in terms of uh, nutrition. Uh, while NFHS 5 shows a slight uh, improvement, uh, uh, but uh, it's not uh, very significant to anything to talk about. Because if you actually convert them into numbers, what I've done is I've converted uh, uh, NFHS 5 uh, uh, nutrition uh, data uh, uh, in, into numbers. For example, if you look at uh, BMI of women, I mean, which is now 18.7% uh, who are below uh, the 18.5 gram uh, uh, BMI, uh, we are, we're talking about uh, uh, 50, uh, 53 million women. So it's a huge number in terms of numbers, it's huge. For men, it is 46 million men with a BMI of 16.2. Uh, so, so men kind of uh, do a little better than women. Uh, but I think it's it's um, uh, it's anemia which is the major catastrophe. I mean, uh, say Sayuzani say already mentioned that uh, uh, women uh, have a much more adverse kind. It's almost twice, a little less than twice the difference between the male and female. Uh, anemia for adults, uh, so, so which, which is huge. It is uh, uh, for for women. It is fifty two point two, and for 
men it is 25 so this is it's a huge uh, difference and uh, uh, so that speaks volumes and it points out to somewhere in in food intake and and availability of other nutrients uh, to women so clear discrimination uh, is is visible in in, in terms of uh, when you look at anemia data i mean including for children uh, but in, in children the uh, uh, the differences uh, uh, for male and female is uh, probably not as sharp as it is for adults so uh, when you look at anemia or and when you look at uh, the uh, child uh, uh, data on uh, malnutrition i mean again very marginal kind kind of improvements uh in fact in, in the case of anemia for adults it has actually increased between nfhs 4 and 5 i mean that i forgot to mention but uh, where children are concerned i mean again uh, uh, the, the the change or the shift from nfhs 4 to 5 is, uh, is 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 very marginal but again we are talking about huge numbers you're talking about uh, stunted children about 62 million wasted children 34 million and uh, underweight children 56 million overweight is uh, uh, 6 million so in, in terms of numbers they are huge and uh, this shows that we have a, uh, a long way to kind of go in terms of uh, improving uh, uh, nutrition generally and especially the gender differences which we see which are quite sharp uh, uh so and and this 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 despite having icds and uh again icds performance i mean there's a, there are questions on icds in nfhs and uh, you do find that uh, icds uh, does not cover it covers about 56% i think of uh, the children who are eligible uh, uh, as well as women uh, pregnant and lactating in the mid yeah so uh, so coverage is very poor and it got virtually got decimated during the pandemic so yes. uh, i'm i'm sure the second round of states will probably show very poor uh, uh, results i'm not looked at that but uh, yeah so broadly uh, this is what uh, were some of the uh, issues that uh, uh, came to mind in terms of looking at nfhs uh though what i would also like to say in terms of uh, the nfhs survey itself uh it is a female oriented survey i mean its history was rch uh, it emerged from the whole rch uh, program and uh, it's probably a survey which uh, gives you much more uh, gendered information and data as compared to others not that nss doesn't have that but nss reports do not do this kind of gendered analysis which uh, nfhs reports provide of course you can deepen that further because you get access to raw data but uh, i am sure in, in nss also has the same kind of so you can disaggregate everything by gender and uh, uh, do that but they don't put it in their reports i mean their reports are very kind of focused and uh, uh, they certainly don't have an objective of looking at a gendered Uh, analysis but nfhs does and i think that is uh, uh, and somebody has already said that earlier so that's a brownie point for uh, nfhs and, uh, and 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 finally uh, i don't know whether i should say this later or something this is in terms of uh, looking ahead uh, but but i might as well uh, uh, do that uh i think when we look at if you look at the overall kind of uh, uh, indicators which uh, uh kind of uh, which impact service delivery it is very clear that uh, there is a lot of inequity and these inequities are there if you are a woman if you are muslim if you are scheduled tribe if you are scheduled caste if you are rural if you are poor that is the wealth index that they have uh education level and if you belong to an eag state what what was erst while called bimaru states so these are if you disaggregate uh, the, uh, data on on these uh, health and nutrition indicator i mean this is a pattern you see these are the inequities within the system and my sense is that these inequities are there 
because we do not have a strong comprehensive primary health care system. If we were spending two to three percent of GDP on healthcare, we, were, we had all our PHCs and CHCs, all the vacant positions filled up, all kind of consumables, drugs, uh, maintenance done properly. Uh, in, in, in the other sense that we had an equitable healthcare system, which is universal access, we would definitely see a much better picture and much less uh, uh, inequities that uh, we, we see today. And then, then finally, uh, uh, I also kind of, so this is again, mostly NFHS4 uh, 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 based, uh, when I looked at uh, what was the missing gender disaggregation uh, within uh, uh, the NFHS. So like, like for example, there is uh, postnatal care uh, data, but we don't uh, it does it is not disaggregated by sex for newborn postnatal care uh, especially if you link it to the the post neonatal uh, uh, mortality uh, where it is higher for girls this may be something interesting to look at P, uh, postnatal care for newborn is not disaggregated by sex uh, similarly birth weight is not disaggregated by sex i don't i didn't find it uh, uh, ICDS utilization, surprisingly, I mean, the data is there. Uh, so that's not disaggregated by sex. Uh, source of healthcare. So what kind of healthcare service do you use? Public or private? Again, not disaggregated by sex. Uh, so use of health services. Uh, then even some other broad data, like there are questions about type of employment and continuity of employment. Why do we ask that only for women? Why not for men? Uh, and I'm sure these differences can, and there's another uh, set of, I think all, all the fertility tables, you ask about the women, uh, women's education, but you don't ask about the husband's education. So I, I think these are some uh, data which could provide better insights into a gendered understanding. So I'll stop at that and uh, so if there are any yeah. questions or any yeah. further questions you have, uh, I could deal with that. Thank you. Thank you, Ravi, for providing gender analysis of both neonatal mortality, under five mortality, and also highlighting the issue of health inequity and how the budgetary allocation is so inadequate and deteriorating uh, healthcare services, uh, and which exacerbates health inequity and need for a gender disaggregated data. I see in the chat box there are no questions, so I. Uh, request all the panelists to wrap up and have a sum up uh, on the basis of presentations made so far. You have another two, three minutes to give a concluding remark and the way ahead. Uh, we can start with Professor Said. Yeah. yeah. Well, I, just, I want to reply to the questions raised by yeah. Professor. Yes, yes. you can do that. Also. Yeah. And in um, under five mortality, basically, treatment will play a very important role. For male children, uh, they are taken to the hospitals, are bigger hospitals and all those things. Whereas in case of female, it is not taken. And just now, Professor Ravi Dugal also said about the birth weight. Yeah. We have analyzed birth weight, uh, not only from NFHS, this thing, CNSN data, as well as HMIS data. What we have found, there is a high peak at uh, 2,500 uh, 2, grams, 3,000 uh, weight. So it's not a uh, accurate measurement. So maybe they are filling up the farms with 2,500, so there will not be any problem. So we should use carefully birth weight data. We should not do a lot of analysis on the birth weight. And in the second phase, let me tell you that face-to-face -face interview is so difficult. It was very difficult. All the protocols were maintained. Everything has been maintained to do the face-to-face -face, uh, survey in NFHS. Not only in NFHS, we have also done in different states on Sabiman also. There was a lot of difficulty in face-to-face uh, -face service, but I appreciate the enumerators who had gone to the field and also collected the data. And when it comes to face-to-face -face interview, not only for uh, other things, but uh, domestic violence, I am so apprehensive about collecting data in face-to-face -face interviews in the home about domestic violence. It is very difficult to collect the data. Are you? Uh, some sometimes it is very easy to get the telephonic call and where women will freely talk about what she is facing it, or maybe helplines where she can report it. But in the, her own home, where all the people are around, if she will say 
that I am feeling unsafe in my home, suddenly somebody will push her it out, where we will put her. So it's very difficult, very uh, critical to ask the question. Sometimes, so by, uh, but Professor Unisa, perception, where they said the seven reasons under which women can be beaten up. Perception is a different and uh, testimony yeah, of I, one's own experience no of violence. No, no doubt about perception because they are not independent. They are not going, uh, there is no other place for them to survive and they accept it. But what they are doing is they are accepting the violence in the form of yeah. I yeah. don't have. So we have come across cases where uh, do you have any other place to go? We can take you to some other. No. I, can you independently survive? No. So mm -hmm. we, what we can do in, in those situations, we feel very bad. We are helpless. Sometimes we feel very helpless. And the other one about the NSV and the male sterilization. NSV have been popularized, but uh, you look at the thing, use of NSV, only it has uh, there in some of the district where doctors are trained. Otherwise, it is not there. And for male sterilization also, counseling part is very much important. After male sterilization or NSV, those things are missing in uh, our family planning program. If still the apprehension is there about the male, this thing, uh, apart from that, if women get pregnant, what will happen to her? So women said that it is better to, for me to undergo still. Still, when you go and talk in focus group discussion and all those things, I will get a lot of blame outside this thing. This was there. And the third point, uh, the last point, which I wanted to tell you, that uh, we are implementing telesobiman in different states using mobile phone. This thing. So the, there can be a lot of things can be done by using mobile phone. So at present, uh, it has increased. It is going to be, uh, whenever we talk about consumer goods, so over the period of time, it will increase. So mobile phone. Uh, usage among girls as well as women has increased and it can be used in a very good manner. Yeah. We are running nutrition program, intervention nutrition program in the three backward states yeah. in India, so it can be implemented. In yeah. Thank you, Professor Nisa. Uh, now, Professor Mala Ramnathan, what would you like to say? Your closing remarks, yeah. Yeah, uh, very quick closing remarks. Uh, when I said that male responsibility has increased, you have to look at the figures. You know, there is no state which has female responsibility less than 75%. So the increase is from 75, you know, it starts baseline. So of the total contraceptive use, if you remove in, in injectables, yeah. the the maximum contribution comes from female sterilization. Oh. And, and then you have, you know, a trade-off between IUCD and uh, oral pills in parts. And somewhere condoms are jostling for space in that story. Male sterilization, you know, there was this huge complication of depiction of when the numerator is one point. 0.5 minus 0.5 divided by 0.5 oh. or 0 minus 0 by 0. Oh. And if for those of you who don't understand, you can, you're not supposed to do 0 by 0, which means that it was in my NFHS 4, 0. In NFHS 5, it is 0. So if I divide it by NFHS 4, you can't determine it. And 11 to 12 states were that. Okay. In other places, it is 0.5 minus 0.5 by 0.5. Therefore, numerator is zero, so it is zero. So that is a more valid zero than the second zero, which I had to do in order to draw the graph. And I've marked that at the bottom. So that is what I meant because my work in Bihar tells me that there is an, you know, a thoda sa, you know, asha ka kiran where men are willing to take responsibility. They are running around buying condoms, buying, uh, in a taking their wives to get the injectable, facilitating that process in a minimalistic way from small scale qualitative studies. So I want that, let us fan this, let us work towards moving in order to enable them to take more responsibility and create an environment where that happens because I am tired of, you know, this whole TFR story. Now supply ki, ki 
कुछ सोच विमेन एस्पिरेशन है वे फॉर योर डेमोग्राफिक डिविडेंड एंड the demographic nirvana which we are celebrating so you know kabhi you have also celebrated. given the caveat no that it is a uh, it is for the concern for health and safety rather than concern for pregnancy that yeah, men are so using contact. therefore i feel that we need to start somewhere and somewhere someone is using a condom kyun na wo istemal aur wajah ke liye kare let us talk because a lot of if you know my work in infertility tells me male infertility is equated with impotence yeah that is and sterilization can also fall along somewhere in that you know scale and that is a huge problem and what saidunisa is saying is correct a lot of them also are scared that if i get pregnant i'll get blamed better hai to wo you know choice nahi hai qurbani hai qurbani choice nahi she will be blamed if yeah so kab tak is my question so kabhi to unko zimmedariyan lena padega aur lene ke liye kyun na unko protsahan de yeah that is all i am trying to say i'm not saying thank you uh, you know men have uh, got hallows <laughs> okay thank you now punna we are turn <laughs> thank you please unmute punam you are muted punam you muted so mala i am not disagreeing with you or misinterpreting you and i see i mean you know we we have to welcome the fact that irresponsible men minus from being minus are taking a little bit of responsibility i am let's not take it away from them having said that i just feel that uh, sterilization since it has gone down further and the fact that sterilization is female uh, is increasing male sterilization is rigid and there is this belief an obsession about their libido yeah. and their virility which is interpreted i know um in the community as even that is communicated as being impotent they will weak ho jayenge ye ho jayenge wo ho jayenge they say khasi karana male yeah. sterilization they call it khasi karana exactly i also know we also know and we don't talk about it and i hope nfhs can do a include that in the survey next time or the following year they are scared that if they get see everybody in the village comes to know when anybody gets sneezes in the house so sterilization male or female to pakka hi pure gaon ko pata hoga god forbid the woman gets pregnant we know that there's extra marital sex in our country also i at the village level at the city level everywhere and uh, therefore th- there is an obs- there is a fear because ekdam pagri utar jayegi Same. now third uh, so i don't know how we are going to deal with that that's why i keep I, you know i'm not sure we can do much on vasectomy but having said that we must it's not that we shouldn't we must invest in counseling behavior change of both men and women even wives don't as was said earlier want their husbands to get sterilized third i'd like to say that you know men they can be more responsible in taking their wives decision making Uh, uh or their partners and ensuring that women don't have to go through multiple abortions by temporary methods there's enough temporary methods and as far as injectable go mala you know it's only 1% of the modern methods temporary methods it is meaningless at some levels you know unless we introduce it properly we have done you know we've just done a tick mark we've introduced after 30 years one um uh more method and you know what about implants you know we we need to introduce temporary mm-hmm. methods for the young population which is at a reproductive age we cannot get my fear is we are going to get complacent at this 2% we've reached so we don't have to invest much as it is in the health ministry there's one technical guy who's responsible for family planning dr seek the others have all unhone apna palla jhad liya and they think it's not a priority it has to continue to be a priority uh, for young people not family planning but access to contraceptives Imagine access that. to a bigger basket of contraceptives what is our investment in family planning 
4% of our meager 1.4% of GDP budget is on family planning. Of the 4%, we spend literally only 2% on temporary methods. We spend 80% of it on um, sterilization, which includes 70% uh, uh, investment in incentives. These are, you know, I mean, I, I, I also again hope that uh, they can, the survey can include questions. Those who had to make to me or vasectomy, are they doing it for incentives? If women, men get higher incentive than uh, women do uh, 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 for vasectomy, the incentive is 200 rupees higher. How is it that people aren't going and doing vasectomy in spite of incentive? So this whole incentives, new alone disincentives that this two child norm nonsense that we've been uh, hearing, uh, noise that we've been hearing about, you know, fam uh, uh, NFHS is a very important survey to be taken very seriously. We need to educate our politicians using, we need a lot more dissemination like you are doing. NFHS, I'm on the board now of uh, IIPS. I keep saying we have to do more dissemination because demographic data is rich in India, but there are more myths and misconceptions around family planning and a whole range of issues. And fi uh, finally, two, three very quick points. Um, sex education has to be introduced um, uh, or family planning education, whatever you want to call it. I am not a diehard a fundamentalist who says call it comprehensive sexuality education, but we definitely need that. We need better quality family planning. We need more, uh, we need more methods, but along with counseling and management of side effects, now, these are things we, they will become an issue only if they're raised and NFHS is a great place going forward That's and nutritional right. investments. Absolutely. You know, we have to, we have to crack this. What is happening? This should be worrying everybody and keeping people awake. And finally, I, again, I'm repeating, we need to promote a public health response to gender-based violence. Very excellent. Yeah. Now, Ravi, your turn. Yeah, I, I had basically given my closing remarks also, but yeah. the okay. points I kind of missed out, which I think are relevant with the discussion that is happening. One about uh, uh, just kind of referring to what uh, Sayyidu Nisa just said, uh, the treatment is uh, uh, an issue. Because if you look at, for example, the child health, uh, the morbidity uh, data, which is for ARI, diarrhea, and fever, uh, you find that uh, the prevalence is less among girls. So probably underreporting is happening. Possibly, yeah. And but what is interesting is that the there's a huge ga the gap in treatment when it comes to treatment for these di diseases. There's a gap. You know, the, the girls have less access to. Yeah. Treatment is a critical indicator, and that is linked to how strong your healthcare system is in kind of providing universal access. That was one point. The other point I missed out, uh, which uh, uh, for for adult uh, kind of diseases like again asthma, thyroid, and heart disease is more common among women than among uh, 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 men, and diabetes and was is, is uh, uh, prevalent among men so that was again a difference yeah. and uh, another issue which i missed out was on health insurance and because there's a huge jump between yeah. nfhs 4 and 5 in the coverage of health insurance largely due to the state uh, uh, schemes uh, which uh, are there but interestingly also found in this is nfhs 4 that where cghs and uh, uh, state schemes are concerned, uh, there's a slightly higher coverage among women uh, in sharp contrast to ESIC and uh, private insurance and uh, other. This Can you do Janani Suraksha? Is it possible? No, Janani Suraksha would not be insurance. It will not be part of insurance. You only the support. Okay. This is insurance like CGHS, ESI. So in ESIC, of course, there's a huge uh, difference because uh much fewer women work in the organized sector but uh interesting for cghs which is central government employees uh basically you find a higher uh, coverage among women and similarly in the state schemes 
uh, which, which are there. Uh, so these were some other findings I thought I would uh, share. Thank you. Thank you, all panelists. Uh, you have really provided such an important and like all round perspective. The gender analysis of demographic data, whether it's a sex ratio, neonatal and under five mortality, uh, nutrition data, disease pattern, digital connectivity, uh, uh, domestic violence, conveyed that there are no easy answers. Yes, we have a long way to go. Affirmative action, change in gender norms, behavioral change, communication, and increase in work participation. That one very important area where whether it's a census or ILO or NFHS, all data show, and even the, some of the area studies, CMI data, they also give a very, very deplorable picture of women uh, who are out of workforce. Their percentage is continuously declining. I think we need a separate panel discussion just on the declining work participation of women. Another very important thing that has emerged out of NHF, NFHS 5 is that the question that arises that does the low fertility rate burst the myth of population explosion? It also breaks another perception that Muslims are driving high population growth. Among five states with high Muslim population in absolute number and share of population, two states, UP and Bihar, have higher fertility rate than national average. However, what distinguishes these two states from others like Assam or West Bengal or Bengal or Maharashtra, Kerala, Jammu, Kashmir is the lower literacy rate among women. So is it not lack of education uh, and not religion? which is driving population growth in these states. So I think the developmental investment, education of women also emerges as a very important concern. Visibility of gender in statistics and indicators and the disagree need for a disaggregated data, the way Ravi elicited that is extremely important for an action agenda of transformative change in the society. In the absence of census 2021 data due to pandemic, NFHS 5 data gain great importance. We have to like we have the uh, uh, for the policy formulation and also allocation of funds, functions, and functionaries uh, for program implementation. But the central issue, as Ravi raised it, that universalization of health services becomes a very important concern in current context of pandemic and also the uh, results of NFHS 5. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Professor Unisa, Professor Mala Ramnathan, Professor uh, Ms. Punam Mutreja, and Mr. Ravi Dukkal. Over to IMPRI team. Thank you very much. One second. Thank you. Thank you so much, ma'am. And uh, uh, we are way uh, above the time, but very insightful and uh, rich discussion today. And I, uh, on behalf of Imperi Gender Impact Studies Center, I would like to thank all of you for attending this panel discussion on National Family Health Survey Round 5 under a gen gender lens. And I would like to thank all of our uh, panelists today, Poonam ma'am, uh, Saeed ma'am, Ravi sir, and uh, Professor Mala ma'am, and of course our chair, uh, Professor Vibhuti ma'am, for putting so much of hard work on this very interesting topic today. And we all learned a lot. And thank you to all those who attended here or in Facebook Live or watched later. Uh, we do hope that you'll keep on attending our Gender Gaps episodes and our web policy talk. Thank you, everyone. And please take care of yourself. Thank you, everyone. Very nice discussion. I know. So rich. So much work. Homework and each one had done. No? Everyone. Yes. Thanks yeah. a lot. Yeah. Bye. Really. All our articles, good. actually, from yeah. everyone. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Very good. If you share, we will publish it. Yeah, all of them. All of them are prolific as writer also. So I think all four can send the article. And in the Thank journal you. as well as multiple media, no? Because uh, increased presence is there in so in so many forms. Yeah. So. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Have Thank a good you. day. Thank you. Thank you.